start our lesson continuing on the series on the kingdom of God. So I'll start with a question. Who's more free? Somebody that has everything or somebody that has nothing to lose? Somebody that has, somebody nothing, that has to lose. nothing to lose, probably. Has nothing mm -hmm. to lose. Why is that? Because they have nothing to lose, so they can. <laughs> You're not worried. <laughs> they have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Right. They have no liabilities <clears throat> and everything. You know, can't get much worse. Okay. All right. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing, <laughs> <laughs> as the song said. <laughs> All right. So we'll be talking about that a little later. So we've been on a series of Kingdom of God. Uh, some people view Jesus as a moral teacher. So a lot of now, even the world is like, they, they like some of Jesus' saying. We're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of his most popular teachings. But some people view, even the people that aren't Christians, they, they like some of his moral teachings. They look at things like, yeah, things like, love. he says, love your neighbor as yourself, or love your enemies, or... Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow takes care of itself. Or what profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? But one thing we have to remember is that the main message that Jesus taught, that the scriptures tell us, was repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So all of his teachings, all of his, everything he said was in the context of the kingdom of God is here. So that was kind of the whole overshadowing message that he had, him and John the Baptist. John the Baptist came preaching, repent, the kingdom of God is here. So the kingdom of God was the storyline behind the Bible. That's what God started with Adam. He wanted to have dominion over the earth. He was going to rule, have his will implemented through Adam and Eve, through man. They had dominion over earth. God was going to have his will through them. That's the ending when the saints ruling with Jesus. And then the stuff in the middle is to fix what they broke at the beginning. And, and that was the reason that Jesus came back. So that's why we've been on this for almost a year now, the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. And, and we've seen that the, which, yeah, it's hard to believe. I know, I We've seen the, the importance of looking at the context when we're looking at the kingdom of God. So the context of the, the Bible where it is in the Bible and the context of the culture, context of the culture as well. So last week we looked at the parable of the sheep and the goats. And we saw that if you just read it by itself, it looks like, hey, you can be saved by, you know, if you're giving to the poor, if you're visiting the sick, that's what gets you into heaven. But then if you read the context of it, it's Jesus responding to the disciples with four parables. And... The other four, the parable of the, the, uh, the, um, the, the oils, the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, they all had people who got in or didn't get in for different reasons. You know, the, with the oil, they didn't get in because they didn't have oil. The talents, they didn't get in because they, they didn't, he didn't multiply the talents. The sheep and the goat, they didn't, they didn't get in because they didn't feed the sick and feed the and, and do the work, kindness of works. But then we see all the others, the reason for not getting in is clearly uh, just an analogy. We don't think we need oil. We don't think we have to double our money. But the sheep and the goat, it's like, okay, well, this one, yeah, oh, yeah, we got to do this stuff. It's like if we read it in context, it's clear that this is a parable too. We call it the parable of the sheep and the goats. So obviously that's a parable as well. And then also with the context, we saw other with the, just the historical context we saw when we looked at the parable of the wedding feast. The man got kicked out because he didn't have clothes. You know, it kind of changed it once we realized that, well, the king provides the clothes for the people. It kind of changed the context. You know, when, when we say that the parable of the talents, they didn't, they, their, the talents they doubled got a man. When we realized that, okay, talents wasn't what we call talents. It's not their skill and ability. It was a measure of money, so it changes Understanding the cultural changes the context as well. So we'll be look, applying that today as we look at the Beatitudes, going in the Sermon on the Mount. A little bit of background about the Sermon on the Mount. So it's in the book of Matthew. Matthew has basically five big stories in Matthew. So Matthew has a lot of details, but it's 
is kind of different in that he has five big stories and a lot of the details in them aren't in the other Gospels. The first of those is, are five big teaching moments, not stories, but five big teachings of Jesus. And the first of them is the Sermon on the Mount. And so two of the others we covered already. One is the Olivet Discourse, which, which is where the, the disciples asked about the second coming, as we saw the, the oil and the lamp, the forgetful servant, the rich man. So all of that was in that teaching, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And then another big teaching lesson was in Matthew 13, where you had a bunch of parables. You had the parable of the sower, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the dragnet, the parable of the, the pearl of great value, and we covered all of those as well. And so four of those five big teaching moments of Jesus were about the kingdom of God. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's such a shock to me. <laughs> so this sermon, Sermon on the Mount, so the, the Olivet Discord that we looked at last time, that was his last teaching. So the parable of sheep and goat, that was his last teaching before he went to be crucified. So today we're looking at his first teaching, his first large teaching. So he did some teaching and preaching before this, but this is the first where the details are captured. So this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is early in his ministry, um, chapter 5 in Matthew. This is his longest teaching moment, the Sermon on the Mount. The, the um, Beatitudes are the first, just the first part of it. Or we're going to cover. So Luke and John, they both have the Sermon on the Mount as well, but they don't have all the same details, and it's not as long. And there's some differences. So it's debate as to whether it's the same exact teaching or not. And then some also say, well, Matthew, he didn't always uh, write in order. So maybe this was a compilation of multiple teachings of Jesus. But so we'll get into the Beatitudes, Matthew 5. 1 through 12. You guys be ready to? Ready. Be ready to? All right. All right. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for their sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in, he in heaven is great, for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So those are the Beatitudes. These are the, he's, these are the people who are blessed and uh, the reasons. Uh, so the word Beatitude, we don't actually find that in the Bible anywhere. You know, people, everyone knows about the Beatitudes and we heard the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude isn't in the Bible but the word beatitude comes from the Latin beatitudo, which was the, so in the Latin, in the Vulgate, the, one of the, I guess the original Catholic Bible, the Latin version is beatitudo. So we, they say beatitude, so we say beatitude. So the word blessed, blessed this, blessed that, blessed that, that's beatitudo, beatitudo, beatitudo. So they called it the beatitude. So it's like the blessings. Yeah. yeah if you say the, English, the, the group of. It's, yeah, it's blessings, and also it's, um, so in Greek it's... Be this attitude, be merciful, be, be, uh... Oh, be the attitude to be, oh, uh, sort of. Or yeah, I heard that on the radio. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> so it's, uh, what, what was that again? That be, be this instead attitude. Instead of be, yeah. I mean, instead of do, be to be it. To be it. Yeah. Take yeah. action. You don't have to take action, just, just be identify it. about it. Mm. So the Greek word, uh, it describes, uh, it's fortunate, it's a position of receiving God's favor. It literally means to extend or make long God's grace. And so the, the, it also means to make happy. So the Hebrew word, which it corresponds from, Esher, means blessed, happy, and fortunate. 
but it means all of them at the same time. So we don't really have a word in English mm -hmm. to complain. So they're blessed, they're happy, and they're fortunate. Mm -hmm. So don't they sound happy like happy people to you? <laughs> <laughs> the meat, the persecuted, the mourning. Oh, the hungry. <laughs> so, and then also in the the Hebrew, I guess is there's there isn't really a R or is, and so it's. So they say it should really be pronounced, oh the blessed of the oh the blessedness of the poor in spirit, oh the blessedness of those who mourn. So it's not a you are state of being, it's oh the blessedness of the poor in spirit, oh the blessedness. And so we'll so first we'll do the little biblical context, cultural context, and then we'll get into the analysis of what why are these people blessed? And what does that mean to us? So the, the Beatitudes we see in the Old Testament, there's Beatitude or blessings as well, as in um, Psalms 1-1, you have that one? Yes. So, read the scripture honoring the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So we begin with uh, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Mm -hmm. So there's blessedness that David pronounced, and you have Psalms 119, 22. Um, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Right. So, th so there was. So Jesus didn't start the blessedness or the the way of teaching. It's uh, credited to him, but there were that was kind of something that was already going on in that culture. And so we'll also take a look quickly at the at Luke's version of it. So Luke's version of it. So like I said, some say oh it was the same message Sermon on the Mount. Some say no, this was a different message, and they call it the Sermon on the Plain, because Luke never really said he was on a mountain. So to di differentiate it from the Sermon on the Mount, but but regardless, it was still it was Jesus's teaching, whichever. But he wasn't the first one to use beatitudes. Correct. So how how do we know that again? That he wasn't the first. There was other people before him. Was or David, the okay. what you just read was oh, David. Okay. That was from David. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. David wrote, did it. And then we'll read some others okay. that were. Um, non-biblical. So this is the Sermon on the Plain, Luke's version of it, or either Luke's different teaching of it, Luke 6, 20 through 26. You have that? Mm -hmm. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you who people, when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of, the son of, because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. So we have four blessings and four woes in Luke's. And so woe, basically they're saying these people have received their earthly blessing. And we're saying other people are happy because they haven't received it. So if these are the be attitudes, the attitudes you want to be, then we would want to treat these probably. So Luke says blessed are the poor. Matthew says blessed are the poor in spirit. And so poor in spirit it's a little easier to say, oh, maybe we should be poor in spirit. Just say, blessed are the poor. It's like, okay, is this an attitude we want to be? Do we want to be poor? Do we want to be hungry? Do we want to have men hate us and ostracize us? That's what we're going to look at. It's just, that's how it's often interpreted as these are goals to live by. And uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, we'll go into a cultural context. The other people that use the blessedness. So there's, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Dead Sea Scrolls were some 
biblical or not just biblical, but writings that were, some were biblical writings, biblical, others were other writings that they found in the cave of Qumran uh, more recently than the original things we had the Bible from. So that allowed us to get better interpretations of some parts of the Bible, but it also had other writings. So this isn't uh, canonized, this isn't necessarily inspired by God, but this is just another writing that they found in the this, this Dead Sea Scrolls called the Scroll of Wisdom. So the Essenes, they were a Jewish sect that, so there were Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, and Essenes. Essenes were basically, they thought that that all the other ones were wrong and they, they weren't following it right and they were the only ones that were going to be saved and so they went out into the mountains and thought they should be by themselves. The, the scroll of wisdom has the following. It says, Blessed is he who speaks truth with a pure heart and who does not slander his tongue. Blessed are those who cling to his statutes and who do not cling to her way of perversity. Blessed are those who rejoice because of her and who do not spread themselves in the day of folly. Blessed is he who seeks with pure hands and who does not go after her a deceitful heart. Blessed the man who has attained wisdom and walks in the law of the Most High and applies his heart to her ways, who cherishes her lesson and ever rejoices in her correction, but who does not repel her in the pain of his misfortune. So it just shows other Jewish writings that use the blessedness. And the Essenes felt they were the only ones that were living up to this. Then there was another writing, a Jewish scholar, name of Jesus ben Sirach. So his name was Jesus. This was about 150 years before Jesus. He had writings. He says, uh, so this, this isn't biblical writings. This is just other Jewish writings they had. It said, I can think of nine whom I would call blessed. A tenth my tongue proclaims. A man who can rejoice with his children. A man who lives to see a downfall of his foes. Blessed is a man who lives with a sensible wife. And the one who does not plow with ox and ass together. Blessed is the one who does not sin with the tongue. And one who has not served an inferior. Blessed is the one who finds a friend. And the one who speaks to attentive listeners. How great is the one who finds wisdom, but none is superior to the one who fears the Lord. So it was. Uh, so we see that his teachings are not necessarily in line with Jesus. It's like, blessed is the person who's on top and who gets, gets revenge from his enemies. So as far as the Beatitudes go, so we'll look at how are we, how, what, what do we think of them? How do we look at them? So I'll read. Um, some from some commentaries how they're viewed and then uh, give my take on it so one commentary said the Beatitudes describe which is kind of this is kind of the probably the most common view the Beatitudes describe the ideal disciple and his reward both present and future the person whom Jesus describes in this passage has a different quality of character and lifestyle than those still outside the kingdom Someone else says, those who possess these qualities will be rewarded in the next life. It is a warning to the people who are happy, successful now, telling them that they have already received their reward in life. Another one says, St. Gregory of Nyssa saw the Beatitudes arranged like so many steps, so as to facilitate the ascent of one to another. For example, a humble person comes to be meek. And, or becomes gentle and kind and exhibits docility of spirit even to face adversity of hardship. So it's kind of like a, you reach different levels as they go from meat to humility to all the way up to persecute it for others. Another one thinks the um, dispensationalists say the Beatitudes is the work salvation that is meant to be focused on the Jews going through the millennium. So the, we mentioned them a couple of times. Dispensationalists believe that the dispens we're in the dispensation of grace, and the millennium is a dispensation when the Jews will have to be judged, and it'll be a work salvation. So they think that pretty much all the teachings of Jesus, because Jesus kind of talks about works. So they're saying none of that is relevant to us. This is for the Jews to go through the millennium. We just need to focus on Paul as their take. So 
which is kind of interesting. It's like, it wasn't relevant to the people he was talking to. It's not relevant to us. It's relevant to some future people. Um, another one says, this is not a checklist of things that you're supposed to accomplish. This is a list of things that Jesus is doing in our lives. The process would take a lifetime and beyond. So the, the thing is, when we look at the beatitude as goals, if we look at the beatitude as goals, what you want to, we want to achieve, then if you read all the rest of the commentaries, you have to come up with colorful explanations of what the words were. You say, oh, when he said poor in spirit, this is what he really meant. When he said meek, this is what he really meant. When he said persecuted for righteousness, so you have to kind of change what you would normally think in order to fit it into this is what we should be. This is the goal. So the Beatitudes seem simple when you think about them. Um, but then if you really think about it, it's like, why is Jesus pronouncing a blessing over people that cry a lot? Why is he pronouncing a blessing over people to get beat up? You know, what What does it mean to be blessed? Who's he talking to in the first place? You know, it kind of, if you really think about it, it kind of gets a little confusing. So who is he saying these blessings to and what occasion? So we look back at verse 1. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and after he sat, his disciples came to him. Because okay, his disciples came to him. So was he teaching his disciples? And then, but then you realize in Matthew, at this point in Matthew, Jesus had only chose four disciples. So is he talking to four people? Or is he talking, to, is, are they talking about the whole crowd? So it's probably not, you know, he's speaking to a crowd of people. You have Matthew 4, and then to get some context of the chapter before this, you have Matthew 4, 23 to 25. <clears throat> Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from, from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan, followed him. Okay, so this is the crowd of people that were following him. People that want to be healed, the poor people, the sick people. So the, the marginalized people were following him. And so if you were poor in those days, it wasn't a Silicon Valley poor. So it wasn't a poor, let me decide what I want to eat today poor. It was a poor, you know, you're living hand to mouth. Every everything you earn, you're, you're using to eat that day, and you're worried about what you get the next day. Like a homeless poor. Like a homeless type of poor. They're, they're poor people were though, and also yes, yeah, socially they're at the bottom. There were no food stamps, no government aid, no food banks for them to go to. And if you were sick and hurting, there was no hospitals for you. To, there was, I mean, there was no no one help you. So he was the fishermen, the poor, the hurting people. These are the crowds that were following. Him. These were the people that had gathered around them. So fishermen were at the bottom of society? They were not the bottom because they were working. Mm -hmm. And they had their own business, but they weren't. They were lower than like landowners. Low, lower than a shepherd? I don't know if they were lower than a shepherd. Okay, because a shepherd is just a hired hand. Yeah, a hired hand. They were lower than the guy who owned the sheep. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, the shepherd was pretty low. Because you got fishermen, so the, not if you, so maybe not if you own like your boat or something, yeah. but if you were just a helping fisherman, probably. <clears throat> so the so as Jesus is telling, so these are the poor people, the low end people. So Jesus is telling them, "Blessed are the hungry, blessed are," and so they're like, "Yes, yes, I like this guy. <laughs> this is." They, so he was speaking to them. They were. They were. They were electrified by this this speech. He was he, they were really hyped up to hear this, and so uh, and when he spoke in the first in the temple when he came out as the Messiah, he read this verse Isaiah six one to three. It's Isaiah sixty one. Isaiah sixty one. Yes, one to three. Okay, so we begin with uh, chapter sixty one in Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the 
brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that life may glor be glorified. So he came to proclaim the year of the Lord. Amen. To claim, proclaim the year of the Lord, to comfort those who mourn, to, so he came to, so they'll be called righteous. So he came to the poor. He came to the hurting. He came to the unwanted. And so Jesus is not saying that you should try to be meek. You should try to be poor in spirit. You should try to get persecuted. Jesus is saying that these are the people that he's coming to. And because they accept them, they can receive the kingdom of God. So they're blessed. So these are the people who are receiving the kingdom of God, so blessed are you. You're the ones who are receiving the kingdom of God, so you're blessed. So if they're hungry, literally hungry, and they're blessed because Jesus came for them, how do they get the food? Or, you know, in other words, whatever their problem is, and, and he's saying, blessed are you, does that solve their problem? So it doesn't solve their earthly problem. Okay, exactly. He's saying, yeah. he's saying blessed are you because you will get into the kingdom of heaven. Hungry. Blessed are you because you will you will enter the kingdom. Blessed are you because God will console you. So he's not saying blessed are you because you're going to get food. Yeah. He's saying blessed are you because you have gotten this spiritual access to the kingdom. Yeah. And that's far greater than what you're looking for. So we're probably looking for food right there. Well, that was, I mean? that was the uh, natural. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the yeah. Maybe when they, when they when Maybe. they followed him on the mountain, and he yeah. said, uh, "He's like, well, you guys just follow him." After he fed the five thousand, he said, "You follow me for food." He said, "You you, you should be following me. I have bread this yeah. this greater than bread of life." Yeah. It was hard to tell a hungry person something else other than I got food right here, you know. I mean, it's not easy. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's um, it's not easy, but that's um. I mean, if you see in the poor places in the poor countries, I mean, the churches are popular. You know, yeah. in Africa yeah. and the, in the in the inner cities, and, and because of the hope that they have, and because of realizing that they're blessed, because of realizing that there's something greater, mm -hmm. and so Jesus is telling them. So there wasn't anyone who told them this before. Yeah. So this is the first, I mean, we hear it every Sunday, we hear it everywhere, but this is the first one he's coming out, he's like, hey, you guys can be blessed, and they're like, oh. It probably gave them hope. And it gave them hope. Yeah. And they're like, you know, all, all my life, all, I've only heard people putting us down and yeah. telling me I'm at the bottom and yeah. rejecting me, but now he's telling me that I'm greatest in this kingdom. Yeah. And so it was, so they, were, they had good soil, they, they had the hearts of good and soil. And they had room for hope. And they had, yeah. yeah, and they were receptive. So they were yeah. receptive to hear what Jesus had because they had open hearts. So, mm -hmm. so it's, these weren't criteria to be a Christian. This is Jesus giving a description of those who are following him at that time. So I'll read one commentary. It says, uh, too often these characteristics of the blessing of Christian history have been turned into ideals or virtues that we must strive to attain, poor in spirit, mourning, etc. When we do that, <coughs> we turn them into formula that help us gain status and favor with God, which of course is precisely the opposite of what he's trying to say. Rather, they're descriptions of the kind of people to whom Jesus, in fact, first brought the kingdom of God. Nor does Jesus tell us we should try to be poor in spirit or mourning all the time or try to get yourself persecuted. He simply announces the great surprise that these people who are not significant or honored in the society are precisely the ones who've been received the honor to be first among those let into the kingdom of God. And that was Stanley Harawas. So basically he's saying the last will be first. And the last in society will be the first in the kingdom. Yeah. The last will be first and the first will be last. So those who are first in society came later. 
came later. So that's the explanation of it. And now we'll go through it uh, verse by verse and look at the, the Beatitudes. A no, deeper sir. look at these people. Isaiah 66? Oh, no, not yet. Okay. So I'm going to just go through. So in the verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's like the question is this, the, are they poor? What is poor in spirit? You know, we don't, we don't really use that term. Is, are, are they poor or are they spiritually low? They're not the religious leaders. Or they're, they're low in the, in, the, in the church, in the temple. It's like, well, they're, well, they're both. I think this just sounds like, sound like they're depressed, poor in spirit. Oh, the spirits are low. Beat, spirits yeah, are low. beat down, yeah. hungry, tired. That's poor in spirit. Mm. You know, you're just emotionally down. Right. I don't think it had anything to do with spirituality, you know, just or, or poorness. Well, that can make you poor in spirit if you ain't got any money. If mm. you're tired, it makes you, you know, being hungry is one thing, tired is another, broke is another. All together, you're pretty poor in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> so this was uh, so poor in spirit. So the so we use that. So that's kind of a uh, phrase in English. It would mean that. But then the question is, it what what it, if you say poor in spirit and, and well, blessed if they're poor in spirit. The spirit to me wouldn't mean spirituality because that's kind of oxymoron or mm. it's opposite. Blessed are people poor in spirit, kind of in a secular way, just poor, just like I said, the hungry, tired, depressed. Mm. That okay. type of spirit being poor, not unfaithful spirit. But. Okay. And so we, we see that, uh, so this is actually, um, he's actually kind of quoting Isaiah here. So when Isaiah talks about the poor and contrite in spirit, so we can look at that verse that he's quoting in Isaiah 66, 1 to 2. Uh, this, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things, and so they came into being? Declares the Lord. I'll say that one more time. Has not my hand made all these things, and so they came into being? Declares the Lord. Oh, I'm not done. These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and who tremble at my word. Right, so it was, uh, so the, the, the Greek word poor there is kind of portrays a beggar, but with the poor in spirit, it, um, it's not only poor, but it's humble and lowly. It's mm -hmm. hum it means humble and lowly, yeah. So Jesus is saying that being humble and low position puts you in a favorable position in the kingdom. So basically the idea that whoever's in the worst circumstances is the most likely to come to the kingdom. People who have nothing to lose are the ones that are following Jesus. So we, look, we see that the people who have nothing to lose are the ones who are following Jesus. People, that have, people who might lose their property, their position, their land, their kingdom, they didn't necessarily want to follow him initially. When you say nothing to lose, you mean no earthly things to lose. No earthly, earthly things to lose, things correct, to lose. exactly, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. Like the rich young ruler, he had earthly things to lose. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. he so he walked away. He didn't exactly. I think he ran away. <laughs> <laughs> or at least he walked away one or the other. Yeah. Okay, so then we look at the next one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So then the question is, why are they mourning? Is this a, are they mourning over death? So Jesus, he's talking to people mourning, so it could be bereavement, but it also could be heartbreak. We know there's some type of heartbreak or deep felt grief. But it would be also those who grieve over sin. So the sin of the world and their own sin. Mm -hmm. As in um, 2 Corinthians, you have 2 Corinthians 12, mm -hmm. 20 to 21. Paul uses it in that manner. Yes. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. So 21. Mm -hmm. 
I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. All right, so he's going to mourn over the sins that they have. So, so blessed are the people. So he's talking about the people that, that are mourning over sin, and so they're, they're so bothered by the evil in the world, the evil in themselves, that, that, it, that it bothers them. So they don't live a life of distracting themselves. Let me watch TV. Let me take a vacation. Let me, they don't live a watch of just distracting themselves so they don't have to see the pain. They acknowledge it, and they mourn over it. They're sad about it. They, they live with the sadness of the fact that things are going on in the world and they're waiting for something to be done about it. And so the uh, blessed are those who don't just change the channel when the TV commercial of the starving children come <laughs> on. They, they, you know, they don't, they don't just ignore the suffering and the pain. They actually grieve about it. They mourn about it. You know, they're, they're, they're uh, the ones that... That, uh, so these are the ones that are, are now happy, he's saying. They're happy now because something is being going to be done about it. The things that you've been sad about, something is going to be done about it. So now you are blessed. This was an example of which one? Um, Porn spirit? Oh, no. Mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Okay. Mourn. Over sin. Yeah. Mm. So then we have meek. Blessed are the meek or the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. So to be meek is to think of yourself as not important. So Moses is always thought to be meek. So he was, you know, he was close to God. He was very powerful. You know, he killed somebody. He could do, you know, miracles from God. But yet he didn't think of himself as important. So he was meek. So blessed are those who see the atrocities going on in the world. But they're, they, so they're, so these people, they thought of themselves as meek and unimportant. Because they were lowly and unimportant. So blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So you don't become hungry and thirsty by choice. Well, unless you're fasting. Well, you know, generally you don't come hungry and thirsty by choice. It's something that happens to you that you don't want to be in that situation. And it's, when you're hunger and thirsty, you can't ignore it. Exactly. When you're hungry, you can't just, oh, let me just. It's always it, there. Mm, I'm hungry, okay, let me just do something else, and I'll think about that later. It's like, no, it's always there. You're, you're hungry. Once you're hungry, you're hungry. Yeah. And so these people are hungry for righteousness. So there's a righteousness, which is a right relationship with God, but it's also just a right relationship in general. So it's right relationship with other people. So they, they, they uh, acts of righteousness are doing something. So it's, if I have an offense with you and I want to make that relationship right, that's righteousness. I'm making the relationship right. Mm -hmm. But I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I could also thirst for righteousness of other people that are oppressed. I could see people being mistreated, and I want righteous thing to be done. So like someone, they, they have the saying, oh, you did right by me. You did right by me, meaning that that you did the right thing. Mm -hmm. So being righteous is to act in a manner to restore relationships. So these people, they've seen unrighteousness. So they've seen people have been deprived. They've been deprived of righteousness. They've been deprived of justice. So it's a person who's, who's been wronged by someone and they're longing for it to be made right. They're going to be the ones that are filled with God's justice and righteousness. So it could be someone who's been a, a rape victim, someone who's been abused by the police, or you know, some they've they've uh, they've been wronged, and they're waiting for righteousness. They're waiting for justice. They're waiting to be made right. You know, are, are the atrocities we go through? Maybe someone mispronounced our name on, at Starbucks when they wrote it on the cup. You know, the some of the hardships that we have to endure. It's uh, a <laughs> First world as, as Americans, you mean, you know. First world problems. <laughs> yeah. So. We got and, uh, it so bad. Uh, I heard one lady say that uh, she used to mock the, uh, like, the people who were, you know, the tree huggers, the environment, or the, the PETA animal lovers. Yeah. And she said she used to mock them until she got, like, really, cl she got closer relationship with God. And then she started to realize, 
or well, maybe they have a part of God's, God's heart that I don't have. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things in, in this world like that. When you mm -hmm. get close to God, you look at it differently. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like maybe they have a part of it. So God, maybe it's something God feels is not right. So basically, these hunger and thirst for righteousness, they, they, something that God notices, they notice also. And now they're going to be made right. Now that Jesus is saying, now you guys are going to get, you're going to see that righteousness. That's why they say a lot of ministries are born out of a, a certain ache. Mm. You know, you have an ache for a certain group of people, and that's where a lot of ministries are, are birthed, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they say that's also how you can, uh, one of the ways maybe you can tell your calling mm -hmm. is what do you, what group do you have a, a pain for? What group do you do you identify, or not even identify with, but what group do, do you heart, does your heart ache for? Mm -hmm. Maybe that relates to your calling. If it's a certain group of people that you, that you have a, a heartfelt need to see righteousness for. All right, so let's, uh, merciful. Blessed are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So mercy is an act of care and compassion to help somebody. So it's a loving disposition towards someone who's suffering. So these are the people that are, that are, are caring, they're compassionate towards people. They're um, distressed. They love their neighbors. They're forgiving. And so that's, so, so I mean, so a lot of these traits are traits that we want to aspire to, especially like forgiving. And I heard someone talking about the Lord's Prayer and how we, we pray, we, pr we always pray, forgive us our trespassers as we forgive those who, who have trespassed against us. Yeah. And then it's like, well, are you, do you forgive those who've trespassed against you? And it's like, are you at really want to ask God to forgive you the way you forgive those who've trespassed against you? Not in the same manner. Uh, not, I, you know, cause I mean, that, but that's what we're praying. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's like, do you, is that what you really want to be praying? <laughs> it's like, how, I think, how I think that Father God forgives easier than we do. Yeah. yeah. It's like, how would that look if God forgave you how you forgive others? Well, yeah, we, we have that flesh thing hanging over us, <laughs> that, ving, that vengeful <laughs> thing. And some people, they just can't, for, it's, it's sad, they, they just, there's certain things that it's just hard um, to forgive. The, the movie mm -hmm. The Shack, uh, if you saw it. I didn't the whole, see it. Well, I tried. It's, a, it's a very, almost unforgivable, oh. almost unforgivable sin that wow. somebody does. Yeah. Um, and the man is asked to forgive, and that is... That's the biggest thing in the whole movie, if you ask me. Mm. An unforgivable sin that a Christian is asked to put his feelings aside and forgive the guy. Mm. And uh, so it's a, it's yeah, it, 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 and it's something I'm working on because I have I have issues with that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> right. I think somebody cut me off in traffic. <laughs> I forget my you know for a few seconds, and then I apologize to God. I'm sorry. I I thought those bad words. Sometimes they actually come out. Well, I'm, you know, yeah. and uh, I'm just, I'm working on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think we're all working on it. Yeah, forgiveness is is a tough one. Um, then we get to pure in heart. Blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. So pure in heart, they're not seeking gain or approval or accolades. They have pure motives. They have pure motives. The pure in heart means to be free of selfish intentions or self-seeking desires. And the interesting thing is it says they will, they will see God. It says they will see God. So in Mo the Moses, in John, Paul, they said, you know, no one can see God. You know, you, if you see God, you die. But they're here he says they will see God. And then if we look at Psalms, we have Psalms 24, 3 to 5. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Who may <clears> set? <throat> Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Okay. So, so, he, so it's saying that uh, he who has a pure heart 
They're the ones who can ascend to the hills of the Lord and stand in the holy place. <coughs> so the hills of the Lord, the kind of the, the concept of the Mesopotamian culture was that gods were up high. So the high places were the holy places, and, and they were only gods can be at the high place. So only Moses could go up to the mountain, the high place where we go. But it says, who may ascend to the hills of the Lord? One who has clean hands and a pure heart. So again, we see it saying that the person that has a pure heart is a person that can go to see God. I thought that was interesting. But that, that kind of natural human being doesn't exist. They can get that close. Moses couldn't get close enough to God to see him. Right. So, I mean, I don't, yeah. Because every natural man has sin in him, and he can only get that close to God. Yeah. Then we get to blessed are the peacemakers. So blessed are peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So he's talking about the people who see conflict with other people and then they decide that they want to re reconcile this conflict. They want to get between the two people and they want to resolve the conflict. And we see throughout the Bible that reconciliation is one of the highest values of the kingdom. So he says, you know, leave your tide at the altar if someone has something against you. So reconciling your differences, making peace with other people is one of the high values of the kingdom. So we're, we're in a series on the kingdom of God, yeah. and uh, we're looking at the Beatitudes, and we've seen that, you know, it's like blessed are poor, blessed are this. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that that's not a, a list of things we should attain to, yeah. but he's saying these are the people we came to. They're blessed because they're the ones who accepted the kingdom. So it's not yeah. a list of these are the things you need to be, okay. but it's a list of these are the people who are following him. Okay. okay. So then it says... Blessed are, are those who are persecuted, so persecuted for righteousness. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so that one is not just, so I always looked at that as uh, Christians who are persecuted. But in the, in the first, in verse 10, it says persecuted for righteousness. So it's righteousness in general. It's not necessarily just, just uh, for your faith. Where, where do you find righteousness outside of faith? Righteousness. So someone trying to get right, right relationship. So with another person. With another person, okay. or between. So other that's people. that's another way to use the term righteousness. Yeah. To people mainly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it speaks to those who see injustice and actually want to do something about it, even though it may put them in danger. So if they want to do more than just tweet about it or comment on somebody's Facebook page about it. They're, they actually want to do something about it. <clears throat> um, you know, I was reading about there was a Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran priest who was hung in 1945 for condemning the leadership of Hitler in, in Germany. There was a in Central America, there was an Oscar Romero archbishop who was assassinated during mass for speaking out against the government for human rights violations. And so the so God um, God so the couple of places we hear that God those who are martyred for Christ have a, a special communication with God. So we heard in uh, in Genesis it says, "What have you done?" The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So Abel's blood was crying out to him from the ground. And then in Revelation 6, 9 to 11, who has that? Henry? Okay. So we go chapter 6 of Revelation. Where we have the fifth seal, the cry of the martyrs. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had, fought, had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell in the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them, that they should rest a little while longer 
till both the number of their fellow servants and the brethren would be killed as they were was completed. All right, so the martyrs had a special place in heaven. They were under the throne. And so then we look at um, 11 and 12. Blessed are those people insult and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were persecuted. So this is speaking about Christians that were persecuted. And so, you know, I mentioned an example before where I had a coworker and we were we were out of town in Kansas and we had been, you know, so a group of us would go to dinner after work and and uh and uh, one time just a coworker and I and then so, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, I'm doing Bible stuff, teach Bible stuff. Something came up, you know, me being a Christian. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, you're a Christian? I'm like, yeah. And I was like, oh. I was like, oh, what does that reaction mean? Is that a positive or a negative thing? <laughs> yeah, and then, and then she people. said, uh, oh, well, my dad is a pastor. And I was wow. thinking, oh, okay, it's a positive thing. Oh. And I found out that it <laughs> was a positive oh. thing. So then after that she thought, everything I did, she thought I was uh, so judging she, so her. So she's not, she don't like her dad? No, okay. I guess because he was like judgmental. Well, yeah, a lot of times so the home life of pastors. So she assumed, yeah, yeah a lot of ways. Well, that's why they have to turn preacher's kids. Preacher's kids are Listen, often the wild ones. In the military, that's we all the kids, you, preacher's sons go in the military, they just the drinkers. And, but then I said, oh my God, I'm a deacon's son. So I had to look at myself too. Because, <laughs> you know, you come up kind of the same way with strictness. Yeah, but, I think, but yeah, but it was... But yeah, after that, some then, of the worst actors were pastors' children. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. When they get thousands of miles of miles away from home, nobody's looking at them because they've been restricted all their life. Mm. Just drink, drink, drink. You know, whatever. And uh, yeah. Anyway. So yeah, so it was a was a negative thing. And the next day, you know, we were in the office, and she was like. She like threw me under the bus for some issue we were having. <laughs> wow. She's like, oh, it was Michael and so and so's fault. Michael, it was another Michael. Michael and Michael, they the they did it. Have they, to do this thing it was, it was, she blamed it. It was a. Uh, it was strange because the project manager he had just told us that he was going to be leaving after this. So it's like, why are you even kissing up to this guy? He's not even going to be here. She was like, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't. And it turned out, you know, that wasn't even the issue. The thing she was blaming us for. Looks like you took one for the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, but yeah. that was like really strange because I, I don't remember. You get strange reaction sometimes. Yeah, I was really strange. I mean, I've got, I never, yeah, because like after that, she, you know, no more mm -hmm. hanging out after work. Well, she no found more. out where, you know, where she's coming from. Yeah, I mean, I didn't fully find out why such a big yeah. animosity towards it. But, it. but anyway, we can definitely, especially in work and other places, we can have persecution for being following Jesus. Yeah. A lot of people just have it wrong. They don't understand spirituality correctly. Yeah. So you say Christianity, they understand something different. They think you, hatred and... Yeah, and, uh, they, don't, they don't put the same connotation, uh, the same word. And judge, judgmental and... Strict. And critical. And, 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 yeah. 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 So if we look at these nine blessings, the Beatitudes, I think, what is that point of picture of? Or does that point to any person of it? So we have Matthew 11, 28, 29... Yeah. Uh, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For let me see. Okay, hang on a second. I, <laughs> my phone just did something. Let me see if I can undo it. I'm sorry. Okay. My yoke I get, I get. My uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. For your souls. Okay, so he's gentle, he's humble. You have Isaiah 9 6. Mm -hmm. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, is that the right one? Mm -hmm. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Alright, so he's Prince of Peace. So if we think of someone who was poor in insignificant circumstances, who mourned over the state of the world, who was extremely important, but he didn't consider himself high, he considered himself lowly, someone who had acts of mercy for hurting individuals, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, he inserted himself into dangerous situations for others, people he hated and ultimately was persecuted for righteousness and killed on the cross. So we see Jesus in these Beatitudes. Jesus lived out all of these Beatitudes, and he was the perfect embodiment of these blessings.
Mm -hmm. So now we get to how much we can get of the application under construction. Under construction. So I have a quote from C.S. Lewis's *Mere Christianity*. It says, "Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what He's doing." He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed to be done. You're not surprised. But then all of a sudden he starts kicking the house in a way that hurts. Abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house than the one you thought of. Throwing a new wing here, putting an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come live in it himself. So that's kind of how it becomes when we're becoming a Christian there. We become a Christian and we think, oh, these are the things God is going to work on, God is going to change, and, and these are the things that we're open to. But then maybe God starts working on some things that we didn't necessarily think we needed to have worked on or we didn't necessarily see as problems. So once you begin a Christian a while, you, you realize that God is changing some things you never anticipated, you never thought about. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you never thought about it as an issue. Mm -hmm. um, James 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So we go through trials and we get changed. We get changed and we become a Christian. And uh, so now we're going to talk about some changes, some, some ways we want to change. So we need to be aware that God is working through other people as well. He's working through other people to develop us. When we're proud, God is able to bring other people into our lives to humble us. And so we don't necessarily recognize them as agents of God. Sometimes we just see them as annoyances or, or, or people that are bothering us. Sometimes we disagree with people and they, they don't agree with our perspective. And it takes humility to listen quietly to them. And or, you know, versus cutting them off, cutting them off and risk it. It takes graciousness to respond with humility. So we might find it difficult to admit when we're wrong. So admitting our faults and ask for forgiveness is an expression of humility. Not giving criticism to other people when they didn't ask for our opinions. It's easy to, it's easy to think you know how to solve another person's problem. You know, do we always think we know the other people's answers? Are we quick to correct other people when they make a mistake? Right away. <laughs> <laughs> so are we patient? Do we wait and speak until we understand the situation? Or do we uh, jump right in? Are we grateful? Do we show sincere appreciation to God and others who've benefited our life? People that have benefited in some way? It involves recognizing that we owe other people for our achievement. It's not just us. It's not just because we worked so hard. It's not because we were so great. Other people have something to do with it. Do we appreciate it? Do we thank them? Do we fear God for, his found for, for being the foundation of true success? Fear of the Lord is awareness of God to see all that we do and hold account accountable for our motives, our words, and our actions. It involves fear of punishment for wrongdoing fear of damaging God's reputation from people that know that we're Christians as well. Do we practice deference? Practicing deference is involve limiting our personal freedom, our words, our attitudes and actions not to cause offense to others. So do we limit our freedom so others won't be offended? Do we defer choosing, forego our personal satisfaction not to choose it, cause injury to others? Are we gentle? Do we seek peace from others? Do we respond to people with patience and weakness? Are we wise? A wise person behaves in a way that brings peace, but a foolish person's attitude, words, and actions stir up anger and wrath. A wise person will love one who rebukes him, but a fool reacts with, re with reproof. A wise person learns from his mistakes and also from the mistakes of others, while a foolish person fails to see the cause and effect relationship between the actions and the circumstances in their life. 
A wise person controls his tongue, but a foolish person speaks whatever is on his mind. A wise person listens to counsel and instruction, but a foolish person despises the wisdom. A wise person build up, foolish people tear down. Are we merciful? Showing mercy is to withhold punishment from others who deserve it. Other people that deserve punishment, do we withhold the punishment? We show mercy, uh, one of the rewards of mercy that God has shown us. So a merciful person forgives other people. And then there's compassion, responding to the needs and desires of other people. It's more than feeling sorry for someone's pain. It's, it's, it's feeling the pain along with them. It's feeling the pain along with them. Compassion pers a compassionate person sees faults in others. He sees the faults in others, but then he also sees the pain. So he doesn't necessarily react to their faults. He reacts to their pain that's causing their faults, he or she. They act to heal the person and not to respond in anger. See any, any thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I got people come up to me and they, they start telling me a story. And in the first two or couple of sentences, they say something I don't agree with. Mm. And it's like me getting in a car with somebody. They say, okay, I'll take you there. But then we go a half a block and they make the wrong turn. And you're telling me to sit there and be quiet when I know the person made the wrong turn. But don't say anything. Because I'm trying to be meek and, you know, but we're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> and the guy's telling me, explain something to me about, you know, about the Bible or whatever. And I don't agree with him. And I'm expected to sit there and be quiet. That's very hard for me to do when, when they're, they, they make, make a statement I don't agree with. And they mm -hmm. say, you understand? And I'm supposed to say, mm-hmm. And no, I don't understand. I don't agree. And so, you know, that kind of thing where they're trying to recruit you to go along with what they feel, you don't agree with it at all, but you're supposed to sit there and listen to them until they're finished. And, and they've said 10 things you don't agree with. You know what I mean? And then it's just hard to... To, to hear people talking down the wrong path. It's hard, but, I mean, if they say, do you agree, then you get, you know, they give I'll you the opportunity. No. They I'll give you the opportunity to, <laughs> but if, but, uh, but yeah, if someone is speaking, it's, it's, if you disagree, you can let them finish, and then, yeah. and then hopefully they'll let you finish, and, and hopefully you remember all ten of the areas. Or, but, it's uh, just hard for me to go down that path, and they just keep going further and deeper and deeper, and I'm, and I'm saying, I don't agree with anything, your, your whole premise Mm. You know, but I'll try. I'm working on it. You know. But yeah. It's, uh, so you're talking about like if someone is uh, maybe evangelizing. Or came up to me and said, "I'm I'm pro-choice," or "I'm mm. something else that I just don't agree with," and they try to explain it to me. You know, and I don't agree with it, and I never mm. will agree with it. Yeah. yeah. I think the prop the problem is if we cut them off, then now. It's, it's a combatant situation, it's a and, pe problem, and, and people yeah. don't, uh, and they're not going to hear what you say now. Yeah. It's like, okay, now, oh, now he's arguing, you know, he's trying to argue. You know, if you listen to him and you're like, okay, I, you know, I see your point, but then maybe they'll listen to you. Because, I mean, if they have a strong opinion, you have a strong opinion. Mm -hmm. It's hard to change somebody's mind, or, or I guess if, even if that's the goal, kind of, the, I guess the first question is, what is the goal of it? I don't, I don't bicker with people so much. I just tell them this is what I do and this is what I believe. Mm -hmm. And they can watch me and witness me, you know. But I don't tell them they should do what I do. But obviously that's what I'm telling them indirectly. Mm -hmm. This is what I do. This is what I do. And I think you probably should do similar things, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. This is where I worship. This is how I worship. I'm not telling you what to do, but it's pretty obvious that I'm happy doing what I, you know, that type of thing. But I don't tell people, you should do this, you should do that. Yeah. I think that's uh, yeah, convincing if you, if you just tell, this is what I'm doing, this is why I do it, this is what works. No one can argue with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No one, no one can yeah. disagree. You yeah. know, this is what happened. It's like, oh, I don't believe in God. So I see what you're saying, but this is how he showed up to my life, and mm -hmm. this is what happened, this is what he did. It's like, yeah. they can't argue with that. Yeah, right. exactly. like, this yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a very good uh, witness, mm -hmm. your own you know, this is how it went with me, and you know, I wasn't always towing the line. And there's, and, and even after you become a Christian, there's still an element of hypocrisy, kind of hovering around people that are trying to be perfect, but they know they're imperfect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's a, a air. Well, well, that's what it is. I, I think it's hypocrisy only if you're you saying understand. you're perfect, or if you're if you're 
if you're telling people not to do something you're doing, because going to church isn't saying you're perfect. Yeah, going, and people going, misunderstand. They think Christians think they're perfect. Right. We're made perfect. We're not perfect. Right. We don't, and we don't. I mean, but in the church, you know, we, we know we say everybody sins. So it's only exactly. hypocrisy if you're either you're telling somebody to do something, not to do something, and you're doing it, or you're portraying as the, if the hypocrisy you're doing comes from them on the outside not understanding how the church kind of works. Yeah. Sin and things like and forgiveness and and being contrite and things like that. They think yeah. Christians walk around thinking they're perfect. They don't sin. Yeah. And then they see Christians do the wrong thing and say, "Oh, you're a hypocrite. You yeah. say you're perfect, but you did something wrong." It's kind of like somebody is like, "Oh, well, you're a doctor, but I just saw you sneeze the other day. You're a hypocrite." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or like, "No, you you can't. You go to the hospital every day. And now you're sneezing. You're a hypocrite." Yeah. It's like, "No, go to the." Hospital because I'm sick. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to hospital saying I'm, that doesn't mean I'm, I think I'm the healthiest person on earth. Yeah. It's like going to hospital because I'm sick. <laughs> but a lot of people use excuses, weak excuses, not to you know not to worship. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they the more you put in front of somebody, the more they say, "Well, I can't do it because of this." I say, "You know, you got a lot of excuses." <laughs> mm -hmm. And and that really, I don't go much further than that. But I just say, you know, you have. Everything you told me in the last 30 minutes is really just an excuse. You can, you can get around that if you want to. You know. Well, Sundays I'm always busy doing this, or Saturday nights I'm too tired, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm. You no, know, you can do it if you try. You know. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts? I think it's always different. Um, sharing your faith from a place of non -judge, not, not being judgmental. Mm. Um, but one thing that works for me is usually I'm very quick at pointing out my shortcomings. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so even if I say don't do this, I say I struggle with it too. Yeah, exactly. There you go. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so people are more open, open to yeah. hearing yeah. that. I tell everybody in the church got something wrong with them. Some oh, yeah. you can see, some you can't see. Exactly. From the pastor to the person in the back row. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. Let me read the conclusion. So it includes a uh, a uh, adaptation of it. I think it's from Tim Mackey. I'm not sure. I just found it on the internet untitled. But um, all right. So the Beatitudes do not describe Christian the Christian goals of how we should live our lives. Nor are the Beatitudes Jesus explaining how to be blessed or how to be saved. Jesus is describing those who were receptive to his message. These are the people who were broken enough to accept Jesus as the Messiah. The poor, the meek, the persecuted, the mourning, they were in a state where they were seeking the Savior. Jesus was describing those to whom he first brought the kingdom. So here's an example of how, if Jesus were to give the message in modern days, it may sound. Blessed are the down and out, the unemployed, the underemployed, those getting gentrified, those on the wrong side of globalization, those without a college degree or health insurance, those who are not noticed in church, who are the ones who, who no one looked to for spiritual guidance because the kingdom of God is here for you. Blessed are the sad, the depressed, those mourning the death of loved ones, acts of terrorism, the failure of marriages, another miscarriage, the pain of your genogram, racism in our nation, those who are mourning over their own sin because the kingdom of God is available to you. And one day God himself will wipe away every tear in your eyes. Blessed are the weak, the unimportant, the quiet, the shy, the socially awkward, the uncool, the badly dressed, the people with six Instagram followers. Because that one day you'll be free from the tyranny of what others think of you. And you will take up your role in the kingdom as a king or queen in God's new world. Blessed are the messed up, those who can't get it together, the addicts, the mentally unstable, those from an abusive home. For you will one day be so full of God's love that you won't know where to put it all. Blessed are those who see and feel the pain of the world and don't ignore it. Don't anesthetize themselves with distractions and comfort, but long for something better. Long for God to put the world right. Blessed are those who see and feel the pains of the world instead of getting bitter, instead of hiding, instead of hating, instead of Facebook ranting, instead of becoming complacent, they perform acts of small, merciful ways. Blessed is the little guy, the people who get stomped on, passed over, 
Don't fight violence with violence. One day you will get all that mercy back with interest. Blessed are those who want nothing to do with oppression, greed, and violence, but, know, but, but who know the true source of peace and prosperity isn't a gun or more wealth or better economy, but rather the quiet, peaceful life with God. Blessed are those who are willing to suffer and bring the new world to bear through loving their enemies. One day in the future, as you cling to Jesus, you will see experience and live in God's kingdom fully realized. Blessed are the followers of Jesus in a hostile post-Christian society. Even if you're made fun of, looked down on as stupid or non-inclusive and behind the times, they get to share in the cross-shaped life of Jesus in the kingdom of God, in the here and now, and into eternity. Jesus is saying that you are the blessed ones. God is for you. You are the ones who intuitively accept the value of the kingdom of God. Jesus saw that those who had little to lose were more likely to follow him. But what about those who have a lot to lose? Are you willing to trade it in for Jesus? Are you willing to follow God's will for your life? What are you willing to let go? Jesus is waiting you with his arms wide open and the kingdom that he prepared from the beginning of time. Accept his invitation. Come home to Jesus. Let's walk in the way to seek the truth and live the life. But I got a question. Oh, okay. You say group of people. Hmm. Economic group, political group. Oh, okay. Ethnic group. Yeah, like for example, of, say for me, I have eight for uh, children who have gone to child abuse or, or children of parents who are incarcerated. Well, I have a thing for widows and orphans. Yeah, so that so, would be. So, so that. Your heart aches so, for it, so it's like, yeah. Yeah. maybe, yeah. you know, some people, it's like when they see police brutality against African Americans, they're like, oh, that, you know, that yeah. they, they want to stand up against, or some people, they. Uh, rape victims. Yeah. They, they ho their whole life is focused on, on making that right. Or because we make a big thing about our international ethnicity thing in our group in our uh, congregation. The oh, fact oh, that it's such right. an international mixture, and that's yes. what heaven's going to look like. And so when you say group of people, I'm saying how do you? But no, I get it. You know, a, a, a group that overlaps all the other groups. So it could be. I mean, it could be a specific race. It could be like maybe you have a passion for people who are wrongly incarcerated. But and that's so, that doesn't have any it, it, it has something to do with race, but it's not there's people of all classes and everything that have been wrongly some more than others. Right. Yeah. But but I'm saying but it could be maybe you have an ache for people that are uh, um coming across the border and yeah. then it'll be yeah. a specific yeah. so that, I mean you, it, could, you could go to the Philippines or a specific to volunteer country. because of the, ec the economic situations over yeah. there and just, it just happens that everybody there is Filipino right that's the thing I'm or trying like, to get yeah, at or like Zambia yeah but yeah it, and so it's not like you're targeting Filipinos it's just that that's the way it is there it is what it is and if you're there to help everybody you help is going to be Filipino but that's just the way it is you know if you're there to help people so you can't Import other people from other countries just to make a good-looking group of people in the Philippines. Right. If you go there, everybody's Filipino. You help them. You say, "Well, all everybody I help was Filipino." Well, that's because that's who was there. Right. You know, you didn't look for them. You didn't single them out. They were just there. You helped them. If they had been, you know, some some other ethnicity, you would help them also because their economic conditions, not yeah. because they're Filipino. Right. So I mean, uh, yeah. So it's just kind of what you have a heart for. Like Rich, he has a heart for. The Philippines and Zambia, and he's not Filipino or Zambian, yeah. but that's who... The conditions over who, there call him... Well, the okay. conditions, but but those conditions exist in other places, but he feels specifically drawn to those two places. If like, you want to find a group of people who need help, you may wind up having to go to those places to get a, group, a large group of people in the same situation to help. Mm. It just happens that they're mono, one ethnicity, when they get to Zambia or the Philippines, you're going to most mostly Africans, mostly Filipinos. That's just the way it is when you get there, you know. Right. Yeah, you're so, not looking for them. Right. 
Well, because of their ethnicity, you're looking for them because of their, their status, their economic status. Right. So yeah. your point is that you shouldn't be looking for a specific ethnic group? Exactly. An economic group, um, any group that the poor, the downtrodden, people that you know need help, those kind of groups of people that you have a heart for. Hmm. And uh, sometimes you'll, you'll pick one condition and everybody in that group will be of one ethnicity. That's just the way it is. But you didn't do that on purpose. You didn't go, you understand what I'm saying? Mm. And I think it's because it's, it's not, we don't choose it. God leads us that way, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. kind of just... Yeah, yeah I, don't think, I don't think that we want to necessarily limit the criteria. I don't think it's wrong. If, I mean, if, it, mm -hmm. if the group you go, you're leaning towards happens to be a specific group, mm -hmm. then... It's, yeah, if it's God to put it on your heart, then it's yeah. not like you chose it for that reason. Well, we have the international quality of what we have here is a, 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 a result of, our, of the people who live here. It's just an international thing. That's why our church is kind of international. But if you go to some places, it's not that way. It's not multi-ethnic because all the people there are basically one ethnicity. So well, I think even though... I think most places, even though you have multiple ethnicities, they say Sunday morning is the most yeah. divided time of the of the week. Even though you have multiple ethnicities, most churches are are one ethnicity. Exactly. Or, or most, most are. Maybe prior to maybe ten years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Most because like I used to, I grew up. It was a black church. You know, it was in L.A. Obviously, there's it was in East L.A. So obviously, there were a lot of non-blacks <laughs> around. But it was it happened to be. In, I came to California. I used the term "black church," and my the pastor at the time at Church of Christ he says we don't like to use that term "black church," "white church." We just isn't. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but I know what you mean. Now, if you come yeah. out of urban, some urban uh, city situations in this country, you do have you go to a church and there's 99 percent black folks in there. Well, sometimes. not even urban. If you come from suburban, it's 99 percent one group. The other, as well. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was, yeah, it was pretty But much. that's just the way people worship. I'm just blessed to worship here. I'm really, yeah. I'm proud of it because of that, yeah. the, the tolerance we have and the forgiveness that we have. Because churches require a lot of forgiveness to work properly. Yeah. And there, there's a lot now. There's a lot of multi-ethnic churches. Multi. But it does take a special degree of forgiveness and tolerance and understanding to make that all work. Because everybody has so many different ideas. It takes, yeah, and it takes, because um, there's a difference between multi-ethnic and multicultural. Yeah, yeah. People, you say, oh, it's yeah. multicultural church, it's multicultural church, and it's like, it's, mm -hmm. just because you're multi-ethnic doesn't make it multicultural. Yeah. So multicultural, so most multi-ethnic churches is kind of, the reality of it is, leave your culture behind and adopt the culture of the church. Mm -hmm. So that's not multicultural. It's like everybody in the church is this, does the same church culture yeah. that's not multicultural that's everybody adopt to the church's culture and that's not really that's not something that we're asking is it for new Christians because some people come in they're proud of their ethnicity and their their heritage you know their style of dress or whatever and you know and so to make them say leave that at home when you come in you know act like the rest of us is that what you're saying? Well, I'm not saying that it's necessarily consciously done. It's kind of like once you start going to church, you learn, okay, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that. So it's like all of the songs are contemporary Christian. Yes. It's like, but that's not part of my culture. But I, now I want to become just, I, everybody dresses this way. That's not part of my culture. Well, but we I, have but, people, we have Polynesian so, folks that come in dressed with their, their, their traditional Dress. We have African people dressed with their tra traditional garb. Right. They bring it to church. And right. It's, and it's tolerated. They, they were, it's, it's tolerated. Yeah, it's tolerated. But they, but they're all. We're all singing in English. Okay. We're all in a yeah. So That's it's kind of, of a, ne a necessity to sing in one language. <laughs> we don't have to dress the same. But we have to sing the same for it to make sense. You know. What yeah. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah, just culture. You know, like some cultures. It's a beautiful thing to have 2,000 people all dressed differently, all sounding the same. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's the beauty. Yeah. Their, their bodies look different, but their hearts and their minds are in the same place. Right. Like some churches, it's like everybody wears a suit. The so, way we so grew it's up. Like no, so it's like no matter what your culture <laughs> is, now you're going to wear an American suit, and we're all going to be the same culture. 
yeah. once we get in. You know, here, yeah, we have, you know, some people cultures, you wear a suit, some people wear shorts and a t-shirt, and we accept all of it. When I grew up, if you didn't, if a boy didn't wear a suit on Easter, there was something, you almost it couldn't get in the church. <laughs> a new suit, not just a suit, a new suit every Easter. Mm, yeah. That's what we had to do. Yeah.